City of Adelaide Council meeting on Tuesday, the 31st of January, 2023. The Lord Mayor is in the chair. This council meeting will be streamed live and recorded for publishing to the internet. Please note that an audio and visual recording is being taken of this meeting. This means that your presence at and any contribution you make to the meeting may be collected, used, disclosed or published publicly by the council, including transferring outside Australia. Council acknowledges that we're meeting on traditional country of the Ghana people of the Adelaide Plains and pays respects to elders past and present. We recognise and respect their cultural heritage, beliefs and relationships with the land. We acknowledge that they are continuing of continuing importance to the Ghana people living today. We also extend that respect to other Aboriginal language groups and other First Nations people who are present today. The Council also acknowledges the vision of Colonel William Light in determining the site for Adelaide and the design of the city with its six squares and surrounding belt of continuous parklands which are recognised on the heritage list as one of the greatest examples of Australia's planning heritage. Let us pray. Almighty God, we ask your blessing upon the works of the City of Adelaide. Direct and prosper its deliberations to the advancement of your glory and the true welfare of the people of this city. Amen. Now can I ask all those present to remain standing in silence in memory of those who gave their lives in defence of their country at sea, on land and in the air. Thank you. Please be seated. Five deputations. The first is from Ruth McKenzie and Kath Mainland, who wish to discuss the 2023 Adelaide Festival program. Would you be able to come forward, please, and go to the microphone on the, the table? Thank you. Welcome. Thank you so much, uh, Mayor, and, and thank you everyone for taking a few minutes of your time to allow us to come and say just a few words about Adelaide Festival 2023. Um, Ruth and I are the new leadership team at Adelaide Festival, and um, to begin with, I think I'll just give a little introduction to myself. My name's Kath Mainland. I've been uh, living in Adelaide for nearly a year. I've been in Australia for nearly seven. I'm an Australian citizen but you might be able to tell that I'm originally from Scotland. I've lived and worked and, and breathed festivals, mostly in Edinburgh and then in Melbourne, and now very delighted to be here as Chief Executive at Adelaide Festival, a festival that I've been visiting for nearly 20 years. I'll hand over to Ruth. And I'm Ruth McKenzie, uh, and I started in November. I'm with you till at least 2026, and this week I bought my flat here in Adelaide having sold my flat in London after 22 years there. Um, I've previously worked on festivals in Manchester, Vienna, Amsterdam, the Sister Festival, the Holland Festival, to, uh, of course, our own Adelaide Festival. And I also directed the Olympics cultural program for the London 2012 Games. And it's a thrill to be here. Um, 
The Adelaide Festival 2023, which we're talking about today, is the last festival by our predecessors, Neil Armfield and Rachel Healy, and it shares all of the fantastic and successful characteristics of all of their festivals. This will be their seventh. That's a record for the Adelaide Festival. And we're delighted that we get to take responsibility and stewardship over this great success. Um, it's got all the strengths of a classic Adelaide festival. We're currently at 73% of our box office target for the entire festival. I should say, from an international perspective, that is remarkable. And Verdi Requiem, which is our flagship centerpiece, is all but sold out, with one and three audience members coming from out of state. So that's very important, as you'll hear in a minute. Thank you. Um, free events are a big part of the success of Adelaide Festival. Um, from our flagship free opening event, which this year is back in Elder Park with Spinifex Gum, a, a, a wonderful show by young Indigenous singers that was actually commissioned by the festival in 2018, but this time will be outside for free and with the ASO in Elder Park. It's our gift to the city, um, if you like. We have many other free events, including, of course, Adelaide Writers Week, which this year is under new direction of the titan of Australian publishing, Louise Adler. Um, Adelaide Festival is not just a hugely loved and important event, but it's a massive driver of jobs and the economy. The requiem that Ruth just spoke about will employ literally hundreds of local people, whether that's on stage singing and playing or whether that's backstage building sets and making costumes. And Adelaide Festival is also a great tourism driver. In 2022, as we were still feeling the effects of COVID, over 100,000 bed nights were spent in Adelaide for the festival with a gross economic impact of $58 million. So incredibly important socially and culturally and for, for cheering us up and entertaining us, but also important for the city and its economy. And just a few quick highlights, so uh, which we would urge you to tell your friends about. Um, we're welcoming back the incredible Sydney Theatre Company and Kip Williams, who last year at the festival had a hit with Dorian Gray. This time it's Jekyll and Hyde, and it comes with great acclaim, and we've both seen it ourselves. It's a remarkable piece of world-class theatre. We've got um, the pop legend Lord coming for the first time to Adelaide since 2014. That's a very important date um, for all of those Lord lovers who have been so neglected by her. And we've got Airplay, which is a show for all of the family, most particularly for primary school aged children and their carers. Uh, it's played to 150,000 children over four continents of the world, and this will be its first time in Adelaide. But Alongside the 18 international com countries that are contributing to the Adelaide Festival, it's important for us to stress those world-class com companies here in Adelaide. So we've got world premieres from Slingsby, from Windmill, and from Australian Dance Theatre, which, as you will know, has the first, uh, first nation artistic director in its history. He's doing his first full-length piece, Tracker, which is a piece about his own family, uh, ancestors who were trackers for the police. This is going to be one to, not to miss. We come from a background of public service, and so for us, alongside the importance of serving Adelaide economically, socially, culturally, is the public service, which means that we want to be working all year round with and for the diverse communities of Adelaide. That's our job, is to feed the next generations of creative talent and to feed everyone in the community, young and old. So we're looking forward to seeing you all at the Adelaide Festival. It starts on the 3rd of March with Spinifex Gum, free in Elder Park. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you for that presentation. Um, now may I move on to the next dele delegation. That is from um, Miss S Mrs. Susie Kitto, who will talk about the Adelaide Aquatic Centre. Good evening. 
Thank and you. Would you mind giving us your name so yes. that we can record it? Yes, my name is Peter Fenwick. Thank you. Uh, Lord Mayor and Councillors, thank you for the opportunity to present this petition to you on behalf of my fellow petitioners and numerous others who, are sure, who we are sure would support the three requests that comprise our petition. We present this petition because we believe and feel that we must urgently and jointly take a stand against the continual compromising by state governments of our world unique national heritage listed Adelaide parklands. We believe that the council can and must make such a stand. It has become, it is crystal clear that the previous state Liberal government did not and the current Labor government does not have a commitment to protect and preserve our world unique parklands to the extent which is necessary. On the contrary, both have demonstrated that these parklands are open for commercial and other development. There are many recent examples of this, including the recent proposal to locate and build the new Adelaide Aquatic Centre immediately adjacent a built-up North Adelaide residential area. It is this which has prompted our petition. Locating a major sporting, recreational, commercial facility on the Adelaide City Parklands immediately adjacent to a residential precinct is not only unprecedented, but would set a dangerous precedent encouraging state governments and other organisations to seek to develop similar facilities on our parklands. At a December meeting convened by DIT, the Department of Industry and Transport, to which I and two other local residents were invited, it became clear that DID did not seriously nor intend to address seriously the issue of adequate parking as patronage grew to the projected 1.2 million visitors at this centre by 2030. When put to DIT, their response was, we will rejig the existing car park. Well, it's impossible because that, park, that car park um, is impossible to accommodate any further vehicles. When put to DIT, the option of undercroft parking, it was not taken seriously either, even though it is practically the only way the volume of expected traffic could be effectively managed at this site. One doesn't need much imagination to predict that if the aquatic centre is constructed in that location, that when this additional parking need arises, another slab of adjacent parklands will be sought by state government. Our petition specifically addresses the inappropriately intended location for the new aquatic centre and highlights the need for immediate action to ensure the permanent and irrevocable protect protection of our parklands from any such development. Council can take an, imme an immediate stand by refusing, and I refer to point one of our petition, refuse to grant any lease to the state government for a proposed new aquatic centre in Denise Norton Park or Padin Padin Yilla Park or anywhere within the world unique National Heritage Adelaide Parklands. <clears throat> of course there will be immediate pushback from the state government which at present cannot compulsory acquire the site but we believe if council has the courage to do this then the ensuing publicity will generate greater awareness and support for refusing to lease the land and turn the public's attention to finding an alternative brownfield site, for example, the West End Brewery site. Our second point in the petition, therefore, is for the Council to advise the State Government to choose an alternative near city brownfield site for a new aquatic centre. Our third point addresses the absolute need for the permanent and irrevocable protection of our parklands. As such, we ask the Council to petition the State Government to approve the long-delayed State Heritage listing of the Adelaide parklands and support an application to UNESCO for World Heritage Listing. Past and current state governments' attitudes towards the use of our parklands make it imperative that we make a stand now to send a loud and clear message that we will not tolerate and we will oppose development that compromises our parklands and we will put in place permanent protective measures. To this end, we submit our petition to the Council and ask it to lead the way with our continuing support. Thank you. Thank you. Could I ask Professor McAvoy if he'd like to join us now to discuss dog on leash areas in Victoria Park? Good evening. Thank you, Lord Mayor, uh, for providing me with the opportunity to address the Council tonight. Um, I'm here as a concerned citizen uh, to urge Council to act to help protect the ecology of the beautiful wetlands in the southeast corner of Victoria Park, Bakabakandi, 
by rezoning this area as one in which dogs must be on leash. Now the wetland which occupies just three and a half hectares of the park's 70 hectares is less than 12 months old and it's already an extremely popular destination for Adelaideans who want to walk, run and exercise their dogs or who just want to sit and soak in the beauty and tranquility of the place. The wetland was constructed primarily as a stormwater catchment to prevent flooding of properties downstream during extreme weather events. However, the wetland designers have constructed a series of interconnecting shallow lagoons which have been planted with many thousands of aquatic and riparian plants to create a habitat that has the potential to support a highly biodiverse ecosystem. Already one can see positive signs that this can be achieved. Ducks have established a home and have started to breed. Masked lapwings or plovers are present most days. Tiny dotrels appear occasionally and solitary egrets and ibis have been seen. There are, however, a number of potential threats to the flora and fauna in the wetland. Some will be more difficult to detect, such as from foxes and feral cats who do their work at night. It will be important to monitor these effects over time. On the other hand, the threat from uncontrolled dogs is in plain sight right now. And there's a simple action council can take to minimise this, namely requiring dogs to be on leash while in the wetland. It's interesting, isn't it, that the number of pet dogs in Australia has increased sharply during the COVID pandemic. 47% of households now own a dog. A large number of dogs visit the wetland with their owner each day. I found during two hours of observation just last weekend that 35 or 40% of the 92 people who were in the wetland during those two hours had a dog. Two thirds of the dogs were off leash and one in five of the off-leash dogs were seen to run or swim after birds, causing them to take flight or other evasive actions. These observations backed by others' reports suggest that a bird disturbance episode caused by off-leash dogs can be expected to occur approximately 20 to 30 minutes during the day. Some episodes that I've witnessed, such as a dog chasing birds aggressively through multiple shallow lagoons, or the scattering at dusk of a roosting mother duck and her 12 ducklings have been quite disturbing to watch. No dog that was on a leash was seen to cause fright and flight reactions. It's important to note that off-leash dogs that roam but don't aggressively pursue the birds can also affect wildlife. And according to the wetland manager, Peter Mantzarapis, roaming dogs have trampled on and killed many small plants that now need to be replaced. I'd like to stress that while only a minority of unleashed dogs aggressively swim after ducks or chase birds that are wading and feeding at the water's edge, the accumulative impact is likely to be very significant. A major review in 2014 by Weston and Stan Kuwit of international scientific studies on the topic concluded that off-leashed pet dogs cause significant disturbance to birds in wetlands, coastal dunes and other urban wild areas. Breeding and parenting behaviours are affected, particularly in ground nesting birds, such as ducks and plovers reducing bird numbers. The same authors concluded that these impacts are reduced when dogs are required to be on leash. It's perhaps not surprising, therefore, that many urban wetlands in Australia <coughs> require dogs to be on leash. Examples in South Australia are the Oaklands and the Glade Crescent wetlands under the care of the Marion City Council and the Laratinga wetlands in Mount Barker. Now, while I'm not a dog owner, I like dogs. And for the most part, I like their owners. I also think it important that dogs have open space to run and be off leash. Victoria Park has many hectares where dogs can run free. If the relatively small area occupied by the new wetland is rezoned on leash, dogs would still have ample room to run free. I think the general public and most dog owners will be in favour of such a rezoning. It's very interesting that of their own volition, one third of dog owners already put their dog on leash when walking through the wetland, even though it's zoned off leash. They can see what's happening in the wetland and are doing the right thing to protect this unique, fragile environment. 
My hope is that, the, is that councillors will now do the right thing and vote for Councillor Snape's motion, which is on the, tonight's agenda, to help protect the ecology of the beautiful wetlands in Bakapakandi. Thank you. Thank you. Um, could I now invite Mr Vag to speak about the planning implementation review submission? Thank you. Good evening. I'd like to th start by thanking the Council and Administration for being able to produce such a well-considered comprehensive draft review response, including input from residents and businesses, when at your last meeting it had seemed, an, it had seemed an impossible task in such a short time. I support all aspects of this document and commend it to you for your approval. That said, there are two areas I would like, on which I would like to comment. The first is heritage. I cannot emphasise enough the importance of the recommendation for a single heritage act which takes responsibility for both state and local heritage and removes from the development act and therefore the performance assessment process the ability to demolish heritage buildings. It is most urgent and need not depend entirely on this planning review to be implemented, but should be progressed, progressed through representation to the minister responsible for heritage. I know that the State Heritage Commission believes that local, state and national heritage should be regarded as all part of the same spectrum, and I am sure would welcome merging local and state heritage into the one act. If we do not act quickly, there will be little local heritage left in Adelaide. Currently, SCAP has the power to approve a development which involves the demolition of a local heritage listed property without any independent appraisal of its heritage merits. In answer to a developer's direct question of SCAP, I quote, is retention of the local heritage building alone a threshold issue, close quote, SCAP's convoluted reply was, again, quote, it is not considered that the SCAP cannot entertain an application for demolishing of a, of demolition of a local heritage place. The merits of the application are considered as is required as a whole. This means that demolition is considered in the context of the entire application for development by assessing it against all relevant provisions of the code. In other words, demolition goes into the general mix and is no, important, no more important than any other provision. The authority to demolish heritage buildings must be removed from the Development Act as soon as possible. The next point I wish to discuss is a new one, vibration during construction in heritage areas. When a multi-storey building is being built, there can be a considerable amount of ground vibration, particularly during the demolition and then while building, while building the basement and footings, which sometimes include pile driving. The council's building department has told me that by far the most frequent complaint they have had from residents in Adelaide City about, are about vibration from nearby construction sites. I was informed that there are no numerical standards required by the Act or building regulations and the only resort open to a neighbour whose house suffers damage from construction vibration was to have a dilapidation report prepared, prepared before the construction commences and inspection afterwards to establish the extent of the damage and thereafter to sue the builder, not the developer. Currently, the building code requ requires the builder to pay for a dilapidation report, but it seems the neighbour must pay for the inspection. Heritage buildings are old and are not built on a rigid concrete platform like modern buildings. Indeed, most were built prior to the introduction of reinforced concrete. Rather, they have stone or brick walls resting on the ground which means that ground vibration will affect the walls nearer to the source more than those further away. So the risk of cracked walls, falling mirrors, paintings, cupboards, etc. is very high. 
Such damage is no fault of the nearby resident, yet receiving recompense is an uncertain and expensive process. I would like to see this review response reference vibration, its potential for causing damage to nearby buildings, and to make all costs for managing and repairing damage to surrounding buildings the responsibility of the developer, not the builder. The developer gains benefit from a, de a development. Neighbours do not. Neighbours should not be out of pocket as a result of a nearby development. Therefore, developers should be considered automatically liable for damage caused so that neighbours do not have to mount a civil court case to obtain recompense. Thank you. Thank you very much, Mr Bay. Um, now could I invite Mr Chris Harris uh, to speak about development in Brown Place. Thank you. Right, thank you for uh, allowing me to speak tonight. There's, uh, development location has been lodged for um, Brown Place, North Adelaide. It's located in North Adelaide um, Cathedral Precinct, zone two storeys. It, the development application proposes to demolish a local heritage place and construct a four-storey apartment. In addition, the proposal also wants to construct a three-storey addition to another local heritage place. The council, as an uh, adjacent loaner, own, landowner, is eligible to make a representation to the development occasion. In fact, I was told this afternoon the administration already submitted a represent, representation opposing this development. Uh, particularly addressing the, uh, <clears throat> the demolition of the local heritage building and the uh, bulk and scale of the development. The development says the local heritage was listed by mistake and should be demolished, even though there's well-documented history on its importance. In brief, the building was constructed in 1893 for the Industrial School for the Blind, which is now the Royal Society for the Blind. 1938, it was repurposed as a residential building by well-known architects. However, the adaptive um, reuse of heritage property is recommended in the Planning and Development Infrastructure Act as a way of preserving heritage buildings. This was sensitive and well-executed um, conversion. May 2022, the Heritage Council commended the heritage value of the local heritage place in a letter to this very council. As the council itself assessed the building as worthy of local heritage place, and as the cathedral precinct contains a considerable number of local heritage and state um, listed buildings, I believe it's very important that it maintains, the council maintains its support for the preservation of heritage buildings and heritage areas. In 2021, the same developer lodged very similar plans, um, except it was for five storeys. Um, an adjacent owner, the City of Adelaide, did make a um, response, the recommendation being refused. Um, along with 30 other objectors representing over 80 people also made submissions against the, the proposal. That was uh, earlier developed, was refused by SCAP, and they listed seven different reasons why the proposal should be refused. In the SCAP hearing, the council's opinion carried substantial weight. Some of the uh, reasons the SCAP gave a refusal included demolition of local heritage place, demolition, uh, development greater than two storeys, not low rise on large allotments, not low density, and not consistent with a housing pattern in their locality. Um, it, this is so, it's very similar, as I said, to the last uh, proposal, just reducing it by one level. Um, SCAP may well um, decide to approve it and allow demolition following on from what um, Mr Vega just said. In addition, um, there's going to be 31 car parks and they'll all access through Brougham Court, which is a very narrow, only 4.3 metres wide street. Um, so all the car parks will enter in and out of Brougham Court and so will all the service vehicles, rubbish trucks, etc. Uh, it's going to produce potentially hazardous to the residents of Royal Court and also to pedestrians who use the street to access events at the Adelaide Oval. The seven reasons gave, SCAP gave to refuse the last of them are still applicable to this development, word for word. As I said, 
Um, the Council has already lodged um, a formal response to this new development occasion, particularly opposing demolition of local heritage place and opposing the bulk and scale of the development. I'd also respectfully ask the Council also an additional, uh, additional representation. They'd oppose the use of Brown Court for the entry and entry of car parks and service vehicles. So I thank the Council in opposing development and preventing the uh, development plans and the heritage of the Cathedral Precinct. Thank you. You will notice that the agenda says petitions nil. That's because it hasn't yet been formally received. But when it is, we'll um, lodge the documents within our next agenda paper to recognise that we've received it. Um, may I just also go back to item six, the confirmation of minutes? Um, I'd like to ask that someone move the minutes for the council meeting on the 13th of December, 2022, and also the special meeting of council held on the 17th of January, 23. That's moved by Councillor Abrazimade and seconded by Councillor Snape. All those in favour? That's carried. Thank you, Member. Um, the next item is item 9, which is advice for Councillor Fox and Councillor Fox. Um, Councillor Fox, you have the right number of Now we move on to item 10, uh, which is reports from the CEO. 10.1 is a discussion of the planning system implementation review that we've already heard about this evening. And could I ask that someone approves the submission, including the attachment A on the agenda, and authorises the CEO to make whatever amendments are required? Moved by, by Councillor Chorus, seconded by... Is Councillor Noon's hand up, or are you just waving? Thank you. Seconded by Councillor Noon. Is there any debate? Councillor Kouros? Uh, Councillor Snape? Not debate, very much support. Um, I just know, as you just mentioned, Lord Mayor, that um, a few changes can be made. Um, we've obviously heard tonight about the importance of heritage, and I've received an email um, uh, kind of ch uh, challenging the language around catalyst sites within our um, proposal. Uh, and I'd like to suggest to the CEO, um, through the leader of the chamber, that perhaps we uh, uh, put forward a position of opposing catalyst, catalyst sites completely. As Can I just say that for uh, members, that's on page 52 of the submission? Oh, sorry, page 39 of the submission, uh, it's 52 of the notes. So I'd, uh, I'd, I'd seek support, if necessary, from the chamber just to tweak that, um, to encourage the CEO to tweak that to opposing catalyst sites as opposed to trying to um, improve the system, which we know isn't working. Okay, um, part five, no, sorry, part one of the executive summary. I would remove from uh, minimise development conflicts, that's good, and I would then remove the section strengthens improves catalyst site policies to better respond to development uh, interface issues. I would remove that entire line, and at the end of part one, I would seek to um, include uh, and oppose catalyst sites. Impose your own catalyst yes, thank you, Lord Mayor. I'll just take advice about the wording of that amendment. And we will also wait for the minutes to amend, be amended. So this is an amendment on the screen. I think it will be subject to the deletion of uh, catalyst To confuse sites. things, I was actually technically amending the executive summary, not the motion. That's okay. why I think there's a bit of confusion there. Okay, so let's just not amend the motion.
Um, I think we have, uh, have a device from the administration that, that it would be preferable to have an item three, um, which says all, so that we have authorising the chief executive to amend and finalise um, with specifically the delete, no, uh, part three, please. Yeah, Can you move? Copying that and it yeah. Okay. Um, to um, to amend the report uh, with the opposition to catalyst sites. Thank you. I'm sorry I've, I've amended that slightly with your words, but can we have a seconder for that amendment? I think it will lapse through. Thank you, Councillor. Councillor Martin seconds the amendment. Can we just correct the spelling, please? With the deletion of catalyst sites. could just help you on page 39 of the report, the left-hand side, which is 52 of the double pager, it says, Catalyst Site Policies. It suggests revised policies to better respond to development interface issues and facilitate an improved approval process for non-envisaged land uses. Um, it's, I think that what the councillor wants to do is to remove the notion of catalyst sites altogether because they are quite contentious. I think that's his intent. Um, well, effectively, I just think catalyst sites are quite um, ad hoc. They, they've been, um, they can spring quite literally from anywhere. A developer can be, um, collect, so to speak, several blocks in a row, and then once you've reached a certain um, floor space, all of a sudden that in the legislation becomes a catalyst site. So you could have, um, you know, you have a house or a property, and then behind you have a, what you think is an assurance that no, you can't, it's not really a giant tower put there, but um, yes, all of a sudden the rules change because the amalgamation of properties on that site behind you uh, are over the limit, thus become a catalyst site, and next thing you know, the rules have changed. So I would seek uh, the support of the Chamber to um, support this amendment. It doesn't change any of the other wonderful work that's been done. I think quite early on, when we were discussing this, there was broader consensus opposing catalyst sites, so I'm just clarifying that uh, in our attachment, attached report. But can I ask if anyone would like to speak against that amendment? I'm not sure like I speak for it, Councillor Martin. Well, uh, I, like to, um, I wonder if I can help the mover with a slight variation. Um, uh, I, I did, I did, but I, I note that there's some uncertainty in the room as to what's proposed. And I think what my colleague is saying, uh, as I've been prompted by uh, the North Adelaide Society and other residents who've contacted me, is um, that catalyst sites should be removed uh, in their view, and as their representative, um, I put that they should be removed from everywhere that, that is within or adjacent to a residential area, including from main streets or business neighbourhood zones within the wider residential locality. That is the nub of the issue. Um, I, I would like to propose that um, my colleague accepts that variation and so the refinement necessary would be up to the administration uh, um, and I'm hoping that they can say they can accommodate that for me. If I may propose those words, do I have my... Are you prepared to accept that amendment? If that's what gets over the line, yes, I will accept the amendment. Can, can I just variation. I'm sorry? I'm happy, I'm happy to read that very slowly, if that will assist. Okay. And then we will ask advice from the administration about the capacity to implement this change. 
Sure, and uh, I'm happy uh, for that to occur, Lord Mayor. So um, the wording would be, uh, I'm sorry, it's a very long way away, authorises the Chief Executive Officer to amend and finalise the report um, uh, insofar as catalytes, uh, catalyst sites are concerned. Um, insofar as catalyte, catalyst sites are concerned. To reflect Council's view, they should not be permitted within or adjacent to a residential area, comma, area, comma, including from main streets or business slash neighbourhood zones within the wider residential locality. Zones within the wider residential locality. Now, Lord Mayor, I'm happy um, to, to expand on that further as a means of assisting the administration in offering comment. The I, th I think we might just have advice from the administration Thank about you. the wording. Oh, thank you. Um, through the Lord Mayor. Um, so as Mr. Haridis explained last week, uh, the number of catalyst sites across the city and North Adelaide, um, I think it's important for members to understand that these have been in place as part of the planning reform for a number of years and there will be some implications. Um, I'm not sure of the number that would be um, adjacent to residential areas. Um, Mr. Haridis might be able to just fill that in for you. Uh, thank you, and, and through the chair, um, I, I, this evening I couldn't give you specifically adjacent and within residential areas, but we can speak to those. As you'll be aware from the workshop session that we had, there were two, uh, only two catalyst, catalyst site zones that were activated in the last few years, and 11 in total in the City of Adelaide. It's an important reference that these existed in the Development Act, so they're not new to the Planning and Design Code. This is a, effectively a carryover from existing legislation. That said, um, consistent with where we've positioned the submission, um, it was looking to strengthen policy to deal with exactly this type of issue, the adjacency of these sites within zones and the conflicts that they can uh, entertain with the existing zoning in any particular zone. In many ways, I believe that this focuses the existing intent um, of the submission and allows us to work uh, with the department on ways to improve the use of catalyst sites with a particular focus on where there are tensions with residential areas. Um, so this is implementable insofar as being able to progress discussions, um, but will be entirely dependent on the views of the Department of um, well, Planning and Land Use Services within state government. Thank you for that assistance. Um, I think now it's Councillor Siebentritt. Oh, I'm sorry. Sorry, Councillor. No, that's all right. I, Look, I, I hadn't realised you were still speaking. No, that's all right. I, um, I sat down for the administration's advice and I thank them for that advice because that was certainly the intention to try to accommodate within the comments that um, uh, a sentiment from resident groups. Um, and it is certainly correct. Catalyst sites have been few in number in recent years. However, the threat remains and uh, the, uh, the possibility of high-rise development in residential areas is a threat that's contemplated uh, too often by residents, fearful that it can happen. Uh, and indeed, it's not insignificant that the North Adelaide Society and North Adelaide residents uh, have, um, I guess, been spooked by the Council's actions in developing 88 O'Connell Street, the 17 storeys, uh, abutting uh, single level residential developments. So I'm pleased about that. I do want to just briefly say though that uh, I also endorse um, the comments that have been made tonight, particularly by our, um, uh, our deputations from Mr. Vag, talking about um, heritage properties. It is important, I think, that we reflect uh, that view somewhere in the document as well, that it is appropriate and I'm satisfied about the wording within our document, that heritage properties are a concern of this council and it's not appropriate 
for them to be demolished as part of any development proposal without there having been a, a separate proposal associated with the, uh, the demolition. Look, there are lots of common themes here that we all agree will improve the planning system. Um, at paragraph 21, it's noted that the city plan will be the future, uh, the future mechanism and framework to work with the state government. Um, I lament that we have not completed a city plan. It would have made this task uh, incredibly easy, uh, certainly much easier than it has been. Um, and it will be a much more instructive uh, force to be putting towards uh, any government review um, in the future. Um, nevertheless, I do want to say that I endorse the vast majority of this document and I thank the administration for their work. I just wanted to very speakly uh, rise in support of this uh, amendment, Lord Mayor. I think the key point here is that when we're out speaking with communities, and I thank, uh, thank um, residents for attending with delegations, when we're out speaking with communities, they're genuinely concerned about catalyst sites. And I think what's very clear here is language is powerful, and the language at the moment is about strengthening policies in relation to catalyst sites. We need to send a very clear message that. Uh, our residents are not in favour of catalyst sites. However, we also recognise that if there are discussions going on with the state government, we need to look at how we improve those policies. So I believe that with the amendments made here, we can both send a very clear message about uh, reflecting the views of residents, as well as still leaving us in a position to have a strong negotiation discussion with state government. Thank you, Lord Mayor. Um, I just had a question, Lord Mayor. Um, so Councillor Snape was originally moving to delete the section on page 39. Does this motion no longer do that? And that no. revised policies and better respond to? As I understand it, he has incorporated an amendment as clause three, which talks about how capital sites should be dealt with. OK, so our submission will still be that we're looking to revise policies to better respond to development interface issues and facilitate improved approval process for non inverted land uses. Yeah. OK. Um, and I, I have a second question, um, Your Worship. Yes, please. Um, is there any area now in Adelaide that would then not be considered as residential? Or does this include the entirety of Adelaide now? Like, where could we have a catalyst site which is then not a residential area or adjacent to a residential area? I think this speaks to the debate about the interface and the transition zones. And that's a challenge in the city because most of us live in transition and interface zones. Sorry. If, uh, through, the, through the chair, if, uh, we take that amendment to mean that we will look at where there are concentrations of residential areas. We're aware that whilst residents have raised that concern, there are also parts of the city where catalyst sites could be very appropriate to aggregate locations that could be improved. Um, and I have confidence that across the city and North Adelaide, the areas that we're talking about in question, we'll be able to determine with council, also through workshops where we can check in with you, on where we'll take the discussion around intense residential low-rise areas, if I'm to take um, the amendment in focus against built up urban areas that have higher concentrations, for example, of business and, and, other, and other types of development. Councillor, would you like to speak to that item then, the amendment? No? In that case, I'll put the amendment to the vote. I'm sorry, Councillor, do you want to speak? Uh, I do have one question, Lord Mayor. Um, do we have any catalyst sites uh, within the capital city zone? Uh, thank See you, through, you. Chair, um, through the Chair. I don't have the list with me, but I would assume so. It would be unusual not to. Um, the only one that comes to mind um, would be maybe the Holden site or um, sites towards the west. Councillor Abrazimdo, do you want to speak? Um, I, I will uh, briefly speak, um, Lord Mayor. I'll um, speak against this amendment uh, purely because um, I believe what we're trying to achieve would be uh, better dealt with through um, increasing our uh, design integrity uh, or even the way uh, developments interact with the public realm. I completely uh, understand and appreciate the concerns that have been raised by the elected members and by the deputations that uh, we received tonight. 
uh, but I'm just mindful of uh, restrictions that this would cause. But also, uh, um, it reminds me of some of the things that council itself is doing, and that is that we have a population growth strategy. How, will, how are we able to reach that uh, goal if we are restricting uh, development and we're saying that we're not able to build certain things in certain places? So I would just remind members that we want to make sure that we are cohesive, that the left hand is talking to the right hand. We've got a bunch of stuff that we need to do, and all of a sudden we're saying, well, actually, we're going to contradict that, and we're going to cap what happens uh, in this location. Um, so in saying that, I support everything that's on the screen, uh, but not the amendment. It seems to me that uh, this is um, a concern, well I know it's a really big concern for uh, North Adelaide residents. Um, I um, feel that this is going to uh, restrain the CBD um, and we have got a, a population growth strategy. I, I just don't see how we, we are in effect contradicting ourselves. Why can, can we add an amendment um, for the North Adelaide area and not residential? Because that implies for the whole of the city, can we define it to just be for North Adelaide? Um, can I just ask if the council is limitation to the, the area? Um, I love North Adelaide, but absolutely not. This is okay. um, a city-wide issue, especially with South West and South East. Well, then in saying uh, that, Lord Mayor... I'll take um, an amendment if you want to. Uh, can we have that in parts? Um, I'm sorry, can you Oh, okay. Well, we're not going to, he's not going to take it anyway. Um, but can I ask that we can take that in parts? Because I've... I've Absolutely. Yes, yeah, thank you. Uh, I'd like to speak to the motion. Could all those members in favour of the amendment, which is part three of the motion, please rise and stay standing until your name has been called. Councillor Elliott, Councillor Noon, Councillor Siebenter, Councillor Snape, Deputy Lord Mayor and Councillor Giles. Uh, the amendment has been carried. So can I ask, now that we uh, put I, our I minds to, to parts one and two, Count Councillor Davis, do you want to speak? Yes, please. Thank you, Your Worship. Um, I don't think that policy like this should be done on the fly, um, particularly when it actually relates to a major change in the Council's um, statement and, and guided policies and our strategic vision for the City of Adelaide. I actually think that uh, policies like this or changes like this shouldn't be done as a result um, of a resident email and then simply bringing that. And this is actually represents a significant change uh, in the council's viewpoint to our growth strategy and the greater plan for Adelaide. Now, I actually think that this would much better be um, brought to council in a measured and thought out way that we could discuss this and understand the implications of what is a massive policy backflip um, by the city council through um, a workshop or informal gathering of this council so that us as councillors can be fully informed. And if I was to ask councillors here exactly what this policy means, which sites would be included and excluded, I'd suggest to you that you don't know. Um, so that's for that reason I believe that this motion, particularly item three, be voted down and I think it would be more appropriate, Councillor Snape, to bring that back at a, another time for discussion by council. Um, I think that it's clear that we have voted on the amendment and incorporated it, but I'm happy to take the items in series if that's what you would like to do. Um, Councillor? Uh, uh, excuse me, Lord Mayor, I just was confused by Councillor Davis's speech of whether or not he was speaking to the whole motion, because if he... He's speak, he is speaking up the whole motion. Can, and I would like to... Against the whole motion. I'm sorry? Was he speaking against the whole motion? He's speaking against the motion as amended. OK. I'd like to speak for. Um, I think you can, but then we'll take it. Okay. Just one speak. OK. I would like to sp uh, speak for the motion um, in, a, in order to be able to um, 
uh, in order to be able to address some of the issues that Councillor Davis has just raised. Let's be real about this. This is a submission that we're putting into a state government um, with a planning act that all that many, many um, um, uh, residents and also council members have great difficulty with in terms of the role of council and the role of residents in the planning system. Um, catalyst sites has been a very contentious issue for some time in the city since the new act. We've only got until tomorrow to put this submission in. We discussed at our works, workshops about this issue. It's, uh, it's already in there that we, we want a different policy around catalyst sites. All this does is attempt to clarify what we mean by that and I don't think there would be um, much argument in our community about a problem with having a catalyst site in a residential area that is um, that um, residential area because that is one of the biggest fears that our community has about the current planning act um, members can I ask you to now to vote on the motion as amended all those in favor all those against that's carried thank you Um, which is impact grants, community infrastructure grants, round one. This, is, this has been delayed for some months because of the election and um, the caretaker period. Are you moving this, Councillor Davis? Moved by Councillor Davis. Seconded uh, by Councillor Kouros. Is there any dissent or Councillor? Uh, yeah, look, Lord, Lord Mayor, Mayor I, I just wanted to ask a couple of questions to clarify something for me. Uh, and therefore my vote. Uh, and look, I'm really sorry this didn't come through committee first, um, uh, otherwise I would have asked those questions there. There are explanations in the papers for all manner of proposals that didn't meet the requirements for funding, except for two. And there's no explanation uh, for the two applications at 6.3.1 and 6.3.2 which failed to meet the criteria. Can I just briefly ask, what was the criteria they failed to meet? That is the um, KYW Aboriginal Corporation National Aboriginal Child Safety and Domestic Violence Summit and the Australian Passive House Association Ice Challenge. Um, I'm not sure what can be added to this debate because so often these applications have confidential material buried in them. Um, I understand that in view of the weakness of some of the applications, the administration has spoken to the applicants and assisted them to strengthen their applications for the next round. Oh, thank you for that. And just one final question. This is a summary that's being presented to Council for approval. Um, uh, looking at the graph at page 97, there's no breakdown of the details of the strategic partnerships, but I wonder if the administration is able to throw any light on whether any private companies received ratepayer funds through the strategic partnership programs in the period covered by the table? Um, I'm not sure whether, the, whether they are private companies or uh, whether they're incorporated bodies, so I'll... No, the... I understand uh, they're all incorporated bodies. But private companies? Not private... Um, not that we're aware of, but I'm afraid I can't give you any more information than that. Okay, thank you. So, unless there's any dissenting view, I'll put that to the vote. All those in favour, all those against, that's carried unanimously. Thank you. Um, the next item. Ten point four. 
mo moved. Um, the, the mo this motion is um, the requirements to nominate members to the board. Abra uh, Councillor Abramizé. Moved, seconded by Councillor Kouros. No debate on this matter. If everyone accepts it, I'll put it to the vote. All those in favour, that's carried. Thank you. Carried unanimously. 10.5. Um, this is to award contracts. Um, th this is not in confidence because it speaks of the principles um, and, and not the actual details. And that's moved by Councillor Kouros, seconded by Councillor Abraham Zadeh. There's no debate on those matters. Councillor, uh, Deputy Lord Mayor. Um, look, uh, Lord Mayor, um, I'm afraid I couldn't let this pass without mentioning this is the conclusion of a very important project that was begun by Councillor Clearahan in the 2014-18 Council, partly completed by the previous Council, and this represents the end of um, the possibility of flooding that we've known in that uh, that part of North Adelaide. And Excuse so me, I, Councillor, are you not going to mention Mrs Billy Glanville? I can, if you like. <laughs> Would you like me to mention her as well? Um, my memory of Council for the last 30 years has been Mrs Billy Glanville complaining about the drainage, the bluestone curbing and the lack of maintenance in this street, and I just think this is a marvellous victory for her whole family. Oh, uh, indeed, Lord Mayor, and um, uh, the, uh, the residents of the northern part of Jeffcott Street are already rejoicing, and I'm sure in the southern part they will also. It certainly has been a victory for the residents of the area. Uh, their street will be restored to the condition that it was in uh, quite some time ago in the last century, uh, and I am just delighted that the administration has brought this to us. No, um, I just had a question for the administration, actually. This may or may not be appropriate, but I'll, I'll ask it anyway, which is, um, does this process here give us any insights into inflationary pressures on procurement processes for infrastructure in the city? Through the sea, please. Uh, thank you, through the chair. As far as I'm aware, both projects are within budget. Um, so notwithstanding the fact that costs are escalating rapidly for all our infrastructure projects. Thank you. Uh, and this is a contrary view. Councillor Lai? I'm just uh, making an observation, trying to understand the rationale why the CEO has the authority to approve $2 million below, while when there's a grant, the threshold is only 10000 Is there any rationale to justify that? I think that we are approving the um, contract, and then she will sign the dele under delegation. Councillor, I think that we are making the approval. This is our approval process. Thank you. Apologies, Lord Mayor, your microphone's switched off. Sorry. So we've now approved the notion that we will make nominations to the external bodies. And now I'll ask for um, nominations for each of the items in series. Um, this will be quite a long process, but um, perhaps people know who's going to be nominated next. So could I ask for uh, um, part two? Do, are there any nominations for the Adelaide Airport Consultative Committee? This is a two-year appointment. Councillor Lai? Uh, I'll nominate the Deputy Lord Mayor to the Adelaide Airport Consultative Committee. Are there any other nominations? Uh, have you accepted the nomination, Deputy Lord Mayor? Thank you. Um, so can I move that we appoint the Deputy Lord Mayor to the Adelaide Airport Consultative Committee for two years? Moved by... 
Councillor Lee and seconded by Councillor Abrazimine. All those in favour? That's carried. Thank you. The next um, item is three, which is um, to nominate a councillor for the Adelaide Botanic High School Council for two years. Councillor Snape, I'm sorry. I beg your pardon, Lord Mayor. There's a proxy position as well for the Adelaide Airport Committee. Oh, I apologise. Um, would anybody nominate, be prepared to be nominated as a proxy? Councillor Kouros? I nominate myself. Thank you. It's appropriate that North Adelaide councillors are represented on this board because it, they're the members of our community who have the most disadvantage in the flight paths. Are there any other nominations? Uh, could I ask that someone move to support the proxy um, councillor? Oh, sorry, Lord Mayor, I think the other's put his hand up to make a nomination. I oh. was nominating uh, Councillor Lee. Councillor Lee, do you want to accept a nomination? I didn't hear, I'm sorry. Yes. Um, council members, there are ballot papers already on your desk, so please just um, take one. And do you need to vote for either Councillor Kouros or Councillor Lee? Just one vote, please. This is for the prop. numbered um, in series and we have a, an item two so we need a 2.1 Similarly, I'll insert a 5.1 to accommodate the business events proxy.
What was the result of the ballot, Your Worship? I'd like to nominate Councillor Henry Davis. Um, no one's spoken with this matter, so I'm completely unprepared to uh, consider it. Oh, I just think we should Could share we... it around a bit, you know? Well, yeah, I, I, I'm shocked uh, by the nomination, so I haven't had a chance to consider that nomination. So perhaps we could return to it. Uh, I'll nominate myself, if I may, this one. I'd like to nominate Councillor Henry Davis. Again, I'm shocked by the nomination. I, I thank um, Councillor Snape, but um, if you were considering it, please contact me beforehand so I have a chance to consider uh, you know, whether I should be, um, whether that would be appropriate for that board. But uh, thank you for the nomination, but I haven't had a chance to consider it. Moved by Deputy Lord Mayor, seconded by Councillor Noon. All those in favour? That's carried unanimously. Thank you. No, there's not a proxy for that one. It's the next one, number five. Um, the next item is the Business Events Adelaide Board, and that's one where there is a proxy as well. So can I ask for nominations for the primary position? Councillor Giles? I'd like to nominate uh, Councillor Noon. Councillor Noon. Any other? Councillor Davis. I'd like to nominate Councillor Lee. Councillor Lee. Any other nominations? Councillor Abrazimide. Uh, can I nominate Councillor Kouros? Councillor Kouros. Three nominations. I think we'll have a poll, please. Uh, in fact, I'm going to decline my nomination. I um, think two. I've reached Thank the you. capacity. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. Um, so now it's uh, Councillor Kouros and Councillor Noon um, are seeking appointment to the Business Events Adelaide Board for two years. Thank you, I'm not very good at folding this. I think this is one of the occasions when it would be good to have electronic voting uh, because this is rather slow and tedious.
was successful in the nomination. Um, so can I firstly ask, ask that someone move the appointment of Councillor Noon to the Business Events Adelaide Board for two years? Moved by Councillor Elliott, seconded by Councillor Lee. All those in favour? That's carried. And now could I ask... Uh, what was the result of the ballot? Six, five. Sorry? It was 6-5. Um, could I ask that a proxy now be nominated for this position? Deputy Lord Mayor. Um, I'd like to nominate Councillor Lee, Lord Mayor. Councillor Lee, do you accept the nomination? No, it's for proxy. Uh, yeah, I'm happy to be a proxy. I'd like to nominate Councillor Kouros. Thank you for the nomination, Councillor Davis, but I don't see, like my, see my chances here. I think everything's already written in stone and everything's already been sorted, so I appreciate the, the nomination, but it would have been nice to have seen uh, all my hard Point work that I've done with the board to have continued. I'd like to nominate Councillor Henry Davis. <laughs> yeah, I'm, 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 again, I'm not sure what the pattern is here and why Councillor Snape um, continues to nominate me, but I'm completely shocked by the appointment. I haven't considered when it, when it meets or whether it, if I'd be able to meet the expectations of the board. Um, in future, if you could contact me beforehand, give me a heads up, that would be great. Uh, I'd like to nominate Councillor Siebentritt. Councillor Siebentritt, would you accept the nomination? Um, thank you, Councillor, but no, I won't at this stage. I'd love to consider it in the future. It's an important part of the education system in our city, but not at the moment. Thank you. Um, I'd like to nominate Councillor Kouros. Uh, no, thank you, Lord Mayor. I already expressed which board I was more keen on to take, and uh, I didn't uh, nominate for any of the other boards. Uh, is there no nomination for any of the other boards? I'd like to nominate the CEO. Um, I don't think that that's a fair um, nomination. I think Thank you. Um, so, thank you for that. So, councillors, moved by Councillor Snape, seconded by Councillor Davis. All those in favour? That's carried. Thank you, members. That's unanimous. Um, the horse trials next. Councillor Snape. I actually genuinely do make this nomination. I've heard good things, so I'd like to nominate Councillor Kouros. Again, Lord Mayor, make it very clear that it was the business events of Adelaide that I would like to have been nominated for. I was very clear in my email. I did not nominate myself for any other boards and I won't be subject to. Thank you. Thank you for that, for that explanation. Any other nominations for the horse trials? I nominate the CEO or delegate. If there are no other members of council who are interested in this nomination, could I move that we appoint um, either the CEO or a delegate to this role? Thank you. Moved by, by Councillor Davis, seconded by Councillor Lee. All those in favour? That's carried. Thank you. Um, the South Australian Regiment, Regimental Council. Councillor Abraham Zadeh. Uh, I nominate um, Councillor Elliott. Uh, thank you, Councillor, for the nomination. I gladly accept. Thank you. So, uh, Councillor Noon? Oh. So, move. Moved by Council Abraham today, seconded by Council Noon. All those in favour? That's carried. Thank you, members. Congratulations. Um, and the final uh, item is number nine, Council a councillor for the Royal Adelaide Hospital Auxiliary Executive Committee. Are they the purple ladies? I like I like to nominate Councillor Henry Davis. 
Again, I appreciate the strategy, um, but considering that nobody's asked me for the nomination, I haven't been able to consider it. I'm shocked by the nomination, um, and so I haven't. Really, I, I don't think so, Your Worship. I think I would just I would dispute that in the strongest terms. Can I ask, Lord Mayor, can we have it defined how many were delegated to the administration? Because this is the first time I've actually seen that. I think there were three. It was Adelaide Hyde, uh, Hawke Street, Hawke Street, Hawke Street, Hawke Street. and the Hospital Auxiliary. Okay. Very strange. Thank you. And it was a rather joyous occasion, marked my optimism and youthful enthusiasm. It reminded me particularly of the demographics in our city, which is more diverse, more highly educated and more youthful than the rest of the metropolitan area. More than 50% of us were born overseas, 40% speak a language other than English at home, and on average our age is 30 as opposed to over 40 in the rest of the metropolitan area and the state. It's also of interest that 25% of our community are aged between 15 and 24, and about half of those are international students. It was certainly apparent speaking to the con conferees who came from every continent, were generally below 40, and some were actually still international students studying at university. Uh, previously, I recall never having seen more than 20 or so new citizens at such a ceremony, and it reminded me that with increasing movement and residential arrivals, we need to ensure our services and information are explicit and user-friendly. On Australia Day, like many of you, I attended morning in the morning and in the evening went to the light on the river ceremonies. These events recognised the competing narratives that occupy our national day. The event in the morning acknowledges Aboriginal dispossession and the ongoing gap in achievement whilst that in the evening acknowledges our nation's pride, vibrancy and achievements. The federal government has now reinstated our capacity to organise our citizenship ceremonies as we see fit and on a date we nominate, so in future we can choose to hold ceremonies on an alternative day or evening and I would propose to do so. The Council also celebrated the Lunar New Year we had the biggest street party to date in Guja Street, and it was marvellous to see us back um, as the pandemic recedes and the community and economy return to normal. I and a number of people spoke at the meeting, and despite the rain, which was fitting for the year of the rabbit and a water one at that, um, it was a splendid evening. I think the numbers were really wonderful, and I know many of you enjoyed the day. It's another example of our vibrant, rich and evolving culture in the city and the contribution paid by many people from overseas. On behalf of the City of Adelaide, I commended and thanked the organisers and also the council staff who were included in a wide range of civic events this week and carried everything off beautifully. I thank them all on your behalf. Thank you. Could I ask if someone could move my report, moved by Councillor Siebentritt, seconded by Councillor Snape. All those in favour? That's carried. Thank you. Um, I also have, um, as, a next, as another item, um, council members' activities and functions. Um, 
I think this is just for noting. Would someone move noting? Councillor Davis, maybe? Thank you. Seconded by Councillor Lee. All those in favour? That's carried unanimously. Thank you. And now we move on to questions. So, um, firstly, Councillor Abraham Zadeh, there was an amendment to your motion, your question on notice. May we take it as read? Thank you. Um, and similarly, your second motion again. And so could I ask that you move both uh, questions and replies be taken as read? Thank you. Yeah, the second question was from me. Sorry, your microphone, Lord Mayor. Your microphone. Thank you. Thank All you. those in favour, that's carried. Thank you. Um, and now we have... Um, Next question. Where is it gone? Questions without notice. Oh. Any questions, yep. without questions without notice. Councillor. Thank you, Lord Mayor. Just a quick follow up uh, on 13.1. Um, can I just get clarification that uh, the uh, paid paternity leave also extends to those that may be in, um, uh, to the male employees that may be in uh, LGBTIQ plus uh, relationships as well? Uh, may I ask you to answer that question? Thank you. Uh, thank you. Uh, through the Lord Mayor, um, yes. Um, I need a seconder, yes. Thank you. Um, uh, Lord Mayor, this matter arises uh, because of uh, ratepayers uh, raising this with me and uh, subsequently um, I gave a commitment to those ratepayers that I would bring this matter forward. In this city there are numerous schools where at the uh, beginning and the end of the school day um, the scenes outside the school can best be described as chaotic as vehicles arrive and depart to, uh, uh, to drop off and to pick up students. Uh, St Dominic's College uh, and the primary school in North Adelaide come to mind. Um, for anyone who has been there at those times, uh, streams of vehicle queue, sometimes in two queues, sometimes in three queues, and other vehicles dart in and out where there's an opening uh, to collect a child uh, often running from the footpath to the vehicle in Q1, Q2, or perhaps on the outer edge. Um, it's a scene that is replicated across the city. I have seen it in other schools, and some elected members have raised with me that they too have seen it. And it, it is, in my view, only a matter of time before a child is uh, injured somewhere, uh, injured or worse. And the intention of this motion is asked to ask the administration to look into possible solutions. And there are solutions, and I do invite members and the administration to Google uh, kiss and drop zones in other states. Uh, they are described in some detail, uh, and you can find systems that seem to be working quite satisfactorily. Um, some are supervised, by the way. Some are supervised by teachers or by parents. Uh, and uh, others are unsupervised. Now, I'm not certain how uh, or which would be best uh, in these circumstances, but I, I'm asking that uh, the administration have a look at how successful they are and whether they can be uh, replicated here. Uh, and I do note that the administration advises that if this motion is adopted, it will incorporate it within the, uh, the speed uh, traffic speed review, which is occurring at this time. Uh, uh, and look, uh, frankly, if it takes a little bit longer than the traffic speed review, um, 
I'm not disturbed. I'd certainly like to see the best solution possible uh, if indeed this motion is carried. I agree with the motion. I'm not talking against the motion, but I do have a question. Does the administration, um, have they received complaints in regards to St Dominic's School? Because I have received many complaints in regards to the, the dropping off of the children there. And I just heard Deputy Lord Mayor mention it. I'm just wondering if he received complaints in regards um, th to that. Through the CU. Uh, thank you, through the Lord Mayor. Um, not that I'm aware. Um, the only complaint in recent memory was in um, relation to asking our parking information officers um, to work with each of the schools within the city of Adelaide uh, to help monitor um, and educate parents dropping off children. So I'm not aware, but I can certainly take that on notice and follow up. Could, could you just clarify, is it complaints by the parents or no, the neighbours? No, it's been complaints by residents. Um, and they do uh, double park and it does block the street and it is um, getting a little bit out of control and um, I'm happy to forward the residents who have made the complaints um, and they can give you more information. Thank you for that assistance. Unless there's a contrary view, I'll put that to the vote. All those in favour? That's carried. Thank you, members. Um, Councillor Abraham Zadeh, your Thank you, motion. Lord Mayor. I'll move the motion as printed and seek a seconder. Thank you. Um, Lord Mayor Red, uh, this council has been a, a leader of the current council and the previous council uh, when it comes to uh, tackling family and domestic violence. Uh, uh, and as a, as a matter of fact, since 2019, uh, this council has had a, a number of uh, initiatives um, uh, which have been highlighted both in the motion and the administration comment, uh, whether if it's the uh, Step Up for Gender Equality campaign, the Bystander Action Workshops, uh, Women's Safety Mural and, and so on. Um, this motion uh, talks about a, uh, um, uh, an issue which has been described as a bit of a grey area when it comes to family and domestic violence, and that is uh, coercive control. Now, um, the state government uh, had flagged that uh, they would like to legislate this issue. Uh, they are going to hold a, uh, a public forum uh, to discuss this issue, uh, and all I'm asking is for us to uh, facilitate that, uh, that conversation uh, and provide a, a venue if, uh, if appropriate and possible. Um, so, uh, uh, in saying that, I do commend the motion to the Chamber and I do ask for the Chamber's support. So, I imagine there's no contrary view to that. Do you wish to speak, Councillor Snow? Uh, very, very briefly, just to um, acknowledge um, the Councillor's extraordinary work in this particular area. Um, and I just want to commend him for bringing this motion to the Chamber and I encourage everyone to support. Thank you. Thank you. Um, all those in favour? All those against? That's carried unanimously. Thank you. Um, the next item is Councillor Davis, and I think there may be conflicts of interest related to this. Um, I was disappointed that the councillor sought to have a rescission motion about a decision that was only made unanimously a couple of weeks ago. Um, I believe that this proposition could be seen by many as a means to circumvent the provisions of Section 41 of the Local Government Act 1999 and the City of Adelaide Act 1998 by taking a committee structure established to operate in accordance with Section 41.2 and instead representing it as part of a series of ongoing informational briefing sessions under Section 90A. Information or briefing sessions are designed to provide information only. The sessions have no decision-making or advisory power, and matters must not be dealt with at those sessions in such a way as to obtain, or effectively obtain, a decision on the matter outside of a formal meeting of the Council or a Council Committee. And I contend that the motion the Council is seeking to put will undermine good governance and our capacity to develop or affect policy before it reaches Council. As you've seen this evening, it's quite difficult to amend motions and papers when they reach us because it's not a good format in which to ch make changes to policy. I, will, I believe it would undermine the intention of having working committees as a means of shaping the council agenda and would not include the presence of an interventionist or directional chair. Now, these methods of shaping the council agenda before reports go to full council have been an integral part of the council's business for decades. It's not new or outlandish. It's business as normal in many regards. It's standard and good governance. The fact that chairs of council committees established pursuant to section 41 of the Local Government Act 
attract an additional allocation of approximately 25% to the standard council member allowance. This reflects the additional responsibility and leadership required from a committee chair and would amount to an additional, about additional sum of approximately $7,000 per year set by the remuneration tribunal. This is the cost of good governance in a $210 million enterprise. I repeat, this is standard across local government in this state. So I now turn my comments to what I might regard as the morality of council service being remunerated. Currently, councillors are remunerated to a sum of $28,692 per year. Chairs would get a 25% loading, perhaps reflecting up to 10 hours input preparing and leading each meeting. That might equate to $50 or $70 an hour, depending on the number of meetings held with a fixed remuneration rate for the year. My view particularly on this is that the council's service on the council should be open to all, not just the rich or the powerful, and not only to the big end of town. By attempting to propose a manoeuvre designed to force members to accept a lower level of remuneration, I believe this proposition damages those in full-time employment and those running businesses who will have a further disincentive to serve the community. I believe as a capital city we should not be party to what the community would regard as a clever manoeuvre or one that excludes all but the independently wealthy from service. I would advise elected members not to be embarrassed or intimidated in foregoing their, right, into, foregoing their rightful allowance as determined by the remuneration tribunal. If the decision requires me to cast a deliberative vote, I will oppose this motion. Thank you. Oh, I think there might be some conflicts first. Um, as a, a chair nominated for one of the committees, I have a conflict. I have a material conflict and I'll be leaving the chamber. Um, I think that all four members of those committees, as in position now, would have conflicts. as chairs and that's being recorded. Councillor, you have the floor. Thank you, Your Worship, and thank you for your debate on the matter. Um, in our third term of this council, council resolved to a... Oh, oh thank you for that seconding. Um, on our third meeting of this term, council resolved... Councillor Ho. Thank you. I'm sorry. May I, may I start? Yes. Thank you. That's right. On our third meeting of this term, council resolved to adopt a meeting structure that would put $115,000 into the pockets of councillors. This is in addition to our ordinary payment of $28,000 a year, which we get paid to fulfil our duties as councillors. 7,173 will be paid to committee chairs each year to chair the 10 meetings, which are scheduled to last 1.5 hours each. Uh, which is essentially 15 hours worth of work in terms of chair chairing those committees per year. This equates to a payment of $478 per hour. But let me put that into sp perspective lest we lose touch with our ratepayers. On average, an Australian earns $36 per hour, and it would take an ordinary Australian 5.5 weeks to uh, full-time work to earn what our committee chairs would earn in less than three days. We are not entitled to pay ourselves so, so much for so, so little. Now, I have seen some crocodile tears around Town Hall claiming that the chairs of these committees will be expected to do a lot of work outside of those committees. Now, I direct you then to your attention to clause 6.2 of the terms of reference of those committees. And let me remind you what the duties of the chair will be. The duty of the chair at those committee meetings will be to enforce meeting procedures, Two, adhere to the general principles of fairness and the fact that the meeting will be open to the public. And three, wrap up the debate if we waffle on for too long, which probably happens quite a bit. That would probably be their most challenging uh, position of being a council committee chair. 
Those are the only three duties under the terms of references for those committee chairs. Now, the meeting chair should, of course, read the agenda. I accept that. However, every single councillor here has an obligation to read their agenda and come to council with a fully informed position. And we get paid $28,000 to do just that. We get paid that as an ordinary payment every year to read our reports. The chair has no additional work to do outside of the committee apart from that. The payment of $115,000 a year is unjustifiable, and I think anyone who tries to simply justify that is actually insulting our residents. Uh, councillors, I seek your support for this motion. Thank you, Lord Mayor. Um, following several workshops with the full council, it was clear that a governance structure involving multiple committees with the capacity to make recommendations was the preferred model. A key part of the process was the workshops and discussions of council, where we all sat down and talked through the available governance options in an open and transparent way. Earlier this evening, the mover of this motion stated, and I quote, policy should not be made on the fly and that councillors need to be informed. We were given less than one week's notice of this new governance structure and not held any workshops, nor were there any public access to those workshops which were not held, and there's no accountability for the model that we would then be adopting under this motion. Uh, now we are presented with this motion that not only seeks to undo the decision of council, which was unanimous at the time, but seeks to do so without the workshops discussion consultation and arguing that the former process was not transparent. Lord Mayor, this is hypocrisy at its finest. Uh, on this one, I'm actually taking the perspective of uh, value adding rather than the cost of uh, this mechanism. Uh, I believe it was intended to uh, enhance the decision making mechanism. So uh, I'm really for and the supporting that a, a committee will form recommendations uh, for the council to consider. Any other contributions, any alternate views? If not, I'll ask your seconder if he wants to speak. No, Councillor, do you want to sum up? Yes, I would. Uh, Lord Mayor, I move that motion be put. I'd like to sum up. Um, I'm f I think that that's a procedural motion. Um, so you're trying to gag me? Well, I think. Masculine. Yeah, no, I get it. You get you gag. Uh, excuse you gag. me, I will not have shouting across the chamber. I'd ask you both to sit down, and I'd ask Councillor Davis not to shout. Councillor, I'd rather you didn't shout across the chamber. Um, you can have a personal explanation later, but we're going to have the... Do we have a seconder? Councillor, um, Deputy Lord Mayor. I therefore have to ask the motion to be put. We don't debate it. All those in favour? Yes. That's carried. Against, sorry, I should say against. You're going to vote against and a division? Yes. No? So now we have to put the motion at six because Thank you. Just I'm sorry? All the members in favour of the motion, please rise and stay standing and still until I've said your name. Councillor Ho, Councillor Davis and Councillor Abraham today. Um, come before us. In that case, we will move on to item 15.4. Um, but firstly, we'll ask the four ca um, chairs to return. Please, because it's distracting. No, but I'd ask you just to avoid 
making a disturbance. Um, or Councillor Elliott. Uh, thank you, Lord Mayor. I take the motion uh, as being read already, and I seek a seconder for my motion. Councillor Snape seconded. Thank you, Lord Mayor. Um, I'm really pleased to move this uh, motion, and certainly my first motion in this chamber. Um, and I've received overwhelmingly positive feedback from the co and comments from the community about it so far. Consistently, I'm told that the automation of pedestrian actuated crossings, or PACs, was a fantastic decision made by the previous council uh, that made walking in the city much more comfortable, safe, and convenient for residents and visitors. For once, it felt like council had listened to what city residents wanted their city to feel like. I'm also consistently told by the community that the decision to turn off the automation was deeply disappointing and frustrating. People are sick of feeling like second-class citizens in their own city. During the automation, we saw pedestrians come first for a brief, beautiful moment, giving people a taste of how pleasant the city can be when people are put first. We experienced the convenience of being able to safely and quickly cross our city roads with negligible effect to traffic flow. We experienced noticeable improvements in motorist behaviour towards pedestrians, actually observing the crossing priority and affording pedestrians the safety and dignity of crossing in peace. It went a good way to address the uh, imbalance of power and priority on our streets. This motion seeks an investigation of how many more PACs we can re-automate and which signals we can add longer crossing times to, improving pedestrian priority and safety with the technology that we have, and maintaining smooth experiences for pedestrians and motorists. This motion also seeks the implementation of new crossing technologies, acknowledging that PAC automation delivered fantastic results for pedestrians, but also had limitations as part of a broader traffic management system. This motion forms the foundation of a long -term, uh, for long-term improvements to the safety and amenity for the people walking in our city. I commend the motion to the floor. Thank you, Councillor. Is there an alternative view? Or do you wish to speak? Sorry, Lord Councilor? Mayor. I just want to speak briefly uh, in favour as a seconder, just to say that <coughs> although I wasn't here for the uh, original um, bringing in of the um, automated pedestrian crossings, um, which is in COVID period, just before my time, um, I was um, one of the move. Well, I was a mover of the uh, uh, motion to try and extend it uh, after the trial had lapsed, and unfortunately, that motion did not pass. Um, so I'm very heartened um, to see um, uh, Councillor Elliott uh, bring this motion into the chamber. I think it's a good evidence-based uh, motion, and I encourage the room to support it. Councillor Kouros. Thank you. Um, Lord Mayor, yes, um, I was there for the first motion. I was there for the directive to have the extension, but I am quite willing to support an investigation. Um, that is what we should do as a council. We should not just jump on things. We should have things investigated first, provide a report, have an understanding what impacts this would have on the city, for our residents and for people that come into the city. Um, one note I would like to say equally why there are people that um, well, I live in the city. I understand you know, the, the need of walking freely and, and uh, with, within the city. There is also, um, I have many complaints uh, from residents that live near these um, uh, lights that make noise throughout the night. So if we're looking at this investigation, we'd like to take on board the fact that this disrupts some of the residents. Mainly, I can give you the points where I've got most of the complaints from and happy to feed that to administration. And I do welcome this investigation to take on board all of that. Thank you. That's an important point. So that will be taken on board. Do you have an opposing view, Councillor? No, I don't, Lord, Lord Mayor. But I do wish to embellish um, one aspect of the motion that Councillor Elliott has put and which I support. And, and that is to ask the administration to investigate new technology, not simply how uh, to make better use of the system that we have, there is stunning new technology that's available that can be carried within the existing infrastructure that will also enhance safety through lighting as well as touchless mechanisms. It's really important that we grasp this opportunity to deliver the best possible outcome for pedestrians. Thank you. I don't believe we need an amendment. We can incorporate those ideas in the discussion and review. So all those in favour? All those against, that's carried unanimously. Thank you. And now moving on to the dogs on leash. Um, Councillor Snape. Um, I um, put motion to the floor and ask for a seconder. Seconded by Councillor Lee. Thank you. Well, I don't think I have that much more to add that Professor Doug McAvoy said earlier. I, I don't think you can really beat um, that deputation. 
I will say, uh, since the uh, opening of the uh, wetlands, uh, May of last year, it is an absolutely wonderful um, amenity for our community, and we want dogs uh, and people to enjoy this space, but we also want um, the wildlife, the wetlands, to thrive. Uh, we have seen a significant increase of aquatic birds, waterfowl, and wildlife uh, more generally in the wetlands since its creation. However, unfortunately, we've also had multiple instances of dogs chasing after birds and their young uh, in the water around nests, etc. Um, indeed, I was down there with Professor McAvoy on Sunday doing a, um, a piece with Channel 7, and while we were there for just half an hour, uh, there was three instances that happened right in front of my eyes of dogs uh, running into the water. Um, if this motion is successful, it will only um, take up a very, very small section uh, of Victoria Park. I predict, including the uh, already existing fenced off place in the north, so not fenced off, um, uh, uh, on leash section, that two thirds of Victoria Park will remain off leash, and indeed, approximately 85% of the wide Adelaide parklands will remain off leash. Um, so, in my mind, this is a common sense motion. Most wetlands in urban uh, Adelaide do have on-leash um, rules, on-leash provisions, um, and my last comment would be, uh, obviously it's up to administration if this motion is successful, how, how do they enforce this? Uh, this is asking, asking for signage. If there's anything more, more than that, I would certainly ask for a, a grace period. Um, this is more about educating people and looking after wildlife. This is not about punishing people. And with that, I uh, commend the motion to the floor. See this wetland, I should be proud of what's been done there. Councillor Kouros. Thank you, Lord Mayor. I have an amendment. Um, what would you like? So, can I speak to that? Well, I could read that out. I'm asking for an investigation to be undertaken to assess the impact allowing dogs off leash is having or could potentially have to the biodiversity of the South East Parklands. Um, and administration brings a report back to council via Catatilla, noting the investigation outcomes, any expert advice received, and recommendations from Catatilla. So what I'm asking, what I'm asking for, Lord Mayor, is uh, to follow a process. And we are all councillors, and while we um, do get feedback from our community about what uh, they would like to see happen, we need to have everything evidence-based. Um, we need to actually take people on a journey to the reasons why that we're doing things and why we're putting in restrictions or we're not putting restrictions or we're w whatever we, we choose to do. Oh, Councillor Davis, sorry, Councillor. I think it's uh, really, really important that we do take people on a journey with us and in this education process uh, rather than taking something away, causing confusion and causing public outcry. They're outcry outcry. Um, there are people that, I mean, I do agree, I'm not saying don't protect our wetlands, I'm not saying that don't protect our biodiversity, I'm not saying that at all. Uh, that at all. But what we have learnt um, as a council, especially over the weekend, that we need to take people on a journey, we need to pay, take people to have that buy-in, we need to have people understand, we need to have them educated, we need to have experts, we need to go through Catatilla. Um, which is our subsidiary, we need to have advice from them and then bring a forward a change that is um, uh, agreeable to the public. Um, I just think that this is the best way forward and good practice for us as a council working collaboratively to get the outcome that we want to achieve. So I will accept this amendment on the basis, it's not a direct negative, but it's just suggesting an investigation. It's just worded slightly differently. Um, Anybody speak to or against that motion? Councillor Ho? No, I'm sorry. Councillor Elliott? Lord Mayor, may I speak to the negative of the um, amendment? Thank you. Um, I empathise deeply with the, the sentiment of the, the mover of the amendment, so I do appreciate them uh, bringing this up. I do think, however, there is a well-established international literature around the effect of domestic animals on wildlife and biodiversity hotspots. I think that the administration is quite capable of referring back to. Um, we also have a number of off-leash zones already established, not only within our own city limits, but across the um, Adelaide metropolitan area based on the same logic. I think there's enough literature that we can easily refer back to that doesn't need to muddy the process for this one. It's an easily implementable uh, decision that we can make in this chamber tonight. Yeah, I, I don't disagree with Councillor Elliott in the fact that 
that information is readily available, and I don't think it would take very long for the administration uh, to prepare a report so that this council can be, and our community can be fully informed on it. In fact, I think it's hilarious. Actually, we did a, a workshop on a case study in another council that, um, as a result of a, a resident concern, um, changed the policy, which then resulted in the council needing to backflip its policy. Um, I attended that leadership training and I took that on board, and I think that council decisions should be supported by evidence, but not only particularly so that we can be informed of that, but our community can also be informed as well before we take these types of actions. And we understand exactly what those impacts will be, and our decisions are, are founded uh, on logic. So um, I I, I don't object to the motion at all. Um, I, I think that having a report back to council, and I think we could probably do it um, within a month, quite simply, to bring that information together and to come to a, to a view on it. And I think that taking a measured approach um, to this will be in the best interest of our community. So I, I actually hope that you all vote for this um, amendment. No, because I believe, uh, negative, I, I believe uh, Councillor Stephen Tritt has an alternative Altern alternative amendment, which, yeah. I reject this amendment. So um, we have to deal with this amendment first. We can't amend an amendment. So, Councillor Ho, are you speaking to this amendment? I'm sorry. Well, thank you, Lord Mayor. I'm, I'm speaking to support this amendment. And indeed, I was going to speak I mean, speak to support the original anyway. But like, I really like the idea from Councillor Kuros, what she mentioned was, we, we actually, make, the council needs to make decisions based on evidence, investigations, all right? It's not just you like it or I like it, you don't like it, she, does, she doesn't like it, whatever. At the end of the day, it takes a long time for us to educate the communities that who are either the dog owners who are not the dog owners to understand why the council makes such decisions. Hence, we have got like a report or, or evidence to present to the community. And that is the reason why well, I'd like, like to get the members to support the amendment. Thank you. Yes, uh, Lord, Lord Mayor, if a uh, um, councillor has a variation that or something he wants to add to it, can I accept that? And it can vary it, though. Lord Mayor, could I perhaps speak, uh, speak to the amendment? It would be quite a small amendment to be still a, a very... Don't speak. Don't speak. Can I speak? No. Deputy Lord Mayor. Sorry. Look, thank you, Lord Mayor. Uh, I wish to speak against this mm -hmm. amendment that's been proposed. Um, I hear from Councillor Davis, Councillor Kouros and Councillor Ho, all speaking with one voice about the need for an educative process, which is at odds with what they're proposing. They're proposing an investigation, unless they see investigations as educative processes. Nevertheless, we've heard from residents, we've heard from others that there is a threat to wildlife, uh, that is occurring now and has occurred since this wetland opened. Uh, I find it extraordinary that where there is a threat to wildlife, we would seek to defer a decision on the basis that we want to be sure that there's a threat to the wildlife. I would have thought the appropriate action is to take whatever protective measures are necessary and if required, then review those measures. But this is about cruelty to animals, no question about it. Dogs mauling and chasing birds is cruelty to animals. The motion that's been proposed will put a stop to that. It is within our remit to do that. We should do that. If there's any concern that that action is inappropriate, then it can be reviewed. But think about the animals. Think about the birds. Think about the wildlife. It's important. It's important. Um, thank you. I think we're making, we're getting to a, a conclusion here, and I know which way this is going. So, Councillor Siebentritt, do you have any Well, I'd like to view? speak to the amendment. The first thing I want to reflect on is how wonderful it is to see a, a significant debate in the chamber tonight about evidence-based policy decision-making, and I think we'll all enjoy doing more of that in the future. I think the first thing for me is that there is clear, uh, I agree with the need for establishing the evidence, but there is enough evidence around the impacts of dogs off lead in wetland environments. This is literature that I'm across, so I feel confident that we have enough evidence, and I'm happy to share that with councillors afterwards. 
I think, how, however, though, Councillor Kerris makes a significant point here around the role of cattle tiller in informing uh, what is how this is to be implemented. So while I will be not supporting the amended, amendment, I will be making an alternative amendment in relation to the role of cattle tiller uh, in implementing this. Um, so I, I think that we have to deal with this amendment first, which is almost a completely new motion. So can I ask all those in favour? Um, I think I think you can sum up, Councillor. I think it's appropriate for me to sum up because there are some accusations in the in the risk in in saying that I have. You should certainly have a personal explanation. Yes. Exactly, um, and it's uh, unfair to suggest that um, I'm not taking on board the advice that uh, Michael uh, councillors can give or administration can give to me after the, uh, after the event. What I'm asking is for this to be tabled and to be in a report for people to refer to, the public to refer to, and to make a, an under, have an understanding as to why we're changing it for dogs to be on a leash. So I think that needs to be made very clear that this is not stalling, this is not asking me, and not asking council to, to disregard the fact that having dogs uh, on a, with a, not on a leash causing um, issues for the wetlands. This is about the public having an understanding. All those members in favour of the amendment, please rise and stay standing until I have said your name. Councillor Ho, Councillor Kuros, Councillor Davis and Councillor Abraham Zadeh. The amendment I'm proposing is in relation to the original motion. We're going back to the original motion. This is it. Yep, great. On the screen. So the amendment I'm recommending is that council directs Catotilla to provide input into how to implement this policy based on learnings from other similar initiatives elsewhere in the parklands and advise on options for effective community engagement. I think that takes on board. Have we got those words? Can you repeat it, please? Yep, sorry, I was a little bit quick there. So it directs Cattle Tiller to provide input into how to implement this policy based on learnings from other similar initiatives. Sorry, just slow down, <laughs> please. Thanks, Anna. Just watch, sorry, oh, yeah. oh, yeah, the chair. Okay. If you could watch the screen yep. as well, okay. it would be great. Thank you. Based on learnings from other similar initiatives. elsewhere in the parklands and advise on options for community engagement. Can I just raise a point of order? Yes. Um, my understanding was that a member can only speak once to a motion or an amendment. I think or it's do you get to now amendment. speak to both? It was to an amendment. Yeah, which I think, doesn't that cancel your right to speak to the motion? Ah, cool. Um, I'm actually not convinced that this is in clear English and has your intent. It, it actually needs a lot of work. Can I ask Councillor Siebentritt to try and turn this back into English? Uh, thank you for that feedback, uh, <laughs> Lord Mayor. Uh, perhaps if I could just be clear on the intent, what I'm could indicating. Could you just edit it from the screen and explain to the um, clerical staff what you're trying to say? Because there's something wrong with these words. I, well, I think we could cut off the remainder after parklands. What I'm saying is Cattle Tiller already has experience in understanding how to manage uh, dog off leash or dog uh, on lead areas, is my understanding, and we want to draw on that experience and any evidence base that they've compiled in that process. So. It's really making sure we're learning from past work that's already been done. 
I can suggest some wording that would help. Um, can I just suggest that we don't have much of this elsewhere in the parklands? Do we mean parklands? I'm sorry, councillor. I just want to make this clear because there's a risk that it's ambiguous. Okay. Yeah. I, I could suggest wording, Your Worship. How, how can you help? That the administration writes to Catatilla seeking seeking their input into into the implementation of a dog on leash. Um, uh, in yeah, Park 16. Councillor Siebentritt, I need you to correct this motion because um, it's become unintelligible at this stage. I thought Councillor Davis's uh, re-editing of my words was I can be was helpful. Quite, you <laughs> was quite useful. <laughs> to um, can I not a complete write-off? I'm with you, with your agreement. Will you accept Councillor Davis's words? I was happy with the way he put them, yes. Yeah. Okay, let's get back to this. Um, we, we, uh, that council right to Catatilla. Right to Catatilla. Asking them to advise on implementation of this strategy, was that? Asking them for advice in relation to the implementation. On implementation of this strategy. Yeah. Uh, that will do, I think. S yeah. Short, sharp and simple. Easy. To implementation of this strategy. And delete the rest of it. I'm sorry to have done this to you, Councillor. Are you happy with that? Yes. Um, thank you so much. So let me just confirm we have a seconder. I think we'll, we'll have Councillor Davis seconded. Uh, no, no, no. Councillor Giles has seconded. Thank you, members. Thank you for your assistance. It doesn't matter. It doesn't matter what you do. It doesn't matter what you do. It doesn't matter what you do. Can all the mem can sorry through the chair all the members who voted in favour of oh, sorry uh, all the members in favour of the motion uh, Councillor Ho Councillor Elliot Councillor Noon Councillor Lee Councillor Siebentrick Councillor Snape Deputy Lord Mayor and Councillor Giles. Um, we'll move on to the next item, 15.6, Councillor Giles. Thank you, Lord Mayor. Um, I, uh, I move this motion following the uh, deputation we had from residents who, um, of North Adelaide who... Um... Sorry, can I take a seconder from Councillor Giles? Oh, Gouros? sorry. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, Mary. <laughs> Um, okay, I move this motion um, um, following the deputation of the uh, residents of North Adelaide. Um, this area, but I think the issue that it, in this um, situation isn't just about a group of people that live very close to the aquatic centre. It's about the process of how we involve community in decision making and the impact decisions uh, have on people's basic um, rights as residents. Um, these, uh, um, I've been working closely with this group of people um, since the election um, and they are in a state of shock that they woke up one morning where, uh, to find that what they thought was their house op opposite parks, they'd bought or rented their house opposite a park and the state government had made an announcement um, that they were going to put a large structure right across the road from where they live. It's really important that if, if um, somebody is directly affected by a decision like this, they should have some input and they should be properly, co properly consult consulted around this sort of stuff. But also they should be cons that they, their rights as property owners um, should be um, taken into consideration. I don't believe that um, in the process of consultation there was a consideration that these gr this group of residents had a, a higher level of 
um, of buy-in, if you like, for that decision. It's, it's um, affected them much more seriously than the general community. And so to say that they've, they've been consulted, that the community's been consulted is really um, uh, just brushing the surface or making it look like um, it's superficial and basically wallpaper consultation. This motion basically says that we support those residents um, and their opposition to the location of the centre. And also it gives us as a council a position in relation to the location of the aquatic centre and an ability to go and, and discuss this with the state government um, um, with a clear view from our residents um, to, uh, about trying to get an alternate site that, that does deliver the redevelopment of the, of the aquatic centre but actually also protects their rights as residents. Because if we let this happen, um, right outside the doors of people on the edges of the parklands, it could set a precedent that this sort of development's possible on all the edges of the parklands. So um, I ask that you support the motion. Thank you. Um, I uh, spoke to Councillor Giles about a variation um, and uh, I'm hoping that uh, we discuss that. She said that she was quite happy to take it on board. Uh, variation includes that administration include potential impacts such as noise, increased traffic and loss of amenity and request that these local concerns in the City of Adelaide submission to the Code of Amendment consultation. Um, Councillor Giles, are you happy to incorporate this amendment? Um, yes, I am. Um, when I drafted the motion, the code amendment discussion hadn't really started, so that's a very good addition to it. So um, I can put that to the chamber now, if you're happy. The variation? Please do. Um, from the motion which has been proposed, it's not clear whether we're talking about an alternative site that comes from the much discussed Brownfields location or the existing Park 2 site. The amendment ties it down strictly to the Park 2 site, not to any possibility of a Brownfield site. Is that the intention of the mover and the amender? Look into the minds of the <laughs> mover. Well, I, it, it certainly affects whether I support it or not because if there's a brownfield site chosen, then the potential impact such as noise, increased traffic and amenity requests of local concerns may have nothing to do with the city of Adelaide. It could be in the city of Charles Sturt, it could be in the city of Paynham, it could be anywhere. Um, I can answer it. Um, the problem is that there is two bits, there's another piece of consultation going on right now, so residents are being asked to put in their views about a code amendment on top of the of anything else that's going on. And I, my understanding is that this would allow the council to put in a submission about the code amendment. amendment. So it is, it's, it does, in my view, doesn't negate from the ability to look at an alternative site outside of the parklands. So we agree that it's a fairly open um, a, a clause and amendment. So unless there's an alternative view, Councillor Ho? Yeah, it's not going to be popular, Lord Mayor. I speak against the motion. Uh, well, there's a number of reasons why I disagree with the motion. Firstly, many, many years ago, the council have already missed the opportunity to get funding from the federal government to build a new aquatic center. And now we have the state government to fund for a new aquatic center. I don't really want to see that we miss the opportunity again, because apparently the state, state government is thinking of to get the construction started at the end of 2023. That was my first reason. Second, the, the current aquatic center is not as not function at its best, and it has been. I mean, we have, the council have lost over a, over a million dollar every year, all right, and that is only from the operation, not even the capital works. So longer we keep the old aquatic center and not letting the new one to be built. On one hand, we keep losing money. On the other hand, we could not serve the community in a better way. And at last, that I like to mention, because like, yeah, under, under, I mean, we have listened to the deputation, and I also listened to Councillor Giles for, I mean, when, when, when she presented the motion. But that's one thing I like, like all the members to be aware that, I mean, the aquatic centre 
is already been built in the parkland. Whoever made the decision 40 years ago, well, I'm, I'm not he even here yet. And now, when the new aquatic center centre to be built, we have no net loss on parkland. That's the that is that is the guarantee we have we have received, right? It, I mean, over the last two or three years with such discussion, that's always that's, it has been all, all I mean like a common sense, right? So at the, I mean, for the following three reasons, I don't want to support the motion in front of me, and I ask members to give a consideration. Sorry, I'm sharing a microphone uh, tonight. My husband always said I don't need a microphone. So, um, <laughs> you do. <laughs> look, I'm. I think this. Um, I think this motion I, I do support. In essence, the trouble is that what I the trouble I have with it is that there's state government consultation process happening. And I would prefer to sort of see the outcome of that before we actually pass a motion on this. And, and, and I do actually understand that there's um, issues with the residents, I feel really sorry, but I imagine that they're included or they're part of this consultation process. Um, is that not the case? So it's only this a change of code and not about right. Um, so um, thank you. I, I disagree with the, uh, the comments of Council Ho. Um, in my view, uh, the I understand the, the background and the difficulty with the site, but I do think that the um, residents of North Adelaide would appreciate the support of Council um, in relation to speaking with um, the, the state government. And I think that the motion here is respectful. Um, in asking the state government to uh, find an alternative site. Um, secondly, I don't think we want to miss the opportunity um, to make submissions in relation to the code amendment, and I thank Councillor Kuros for um, her amendment, um, to make submissions in relation to the current proposed site, because I do think that, look, at the end of the day, I think the Cortex Centre is going there. Like, that, that's what's going to happen. It's not going to change. However, I think that this is an opportunity to start advocating very early on on behalf of residents to the state government uh, on the potential impacts of the noise and traffic. And I think that if we can put pressure on the state government now to bring those issues to the forefront of their mind, then even if this project goes ahead, which I do think it will, uh, in the proposed site, uh, which is unfortunate, then um, the, during the design process, um, I believe that we would be standing in a much better position to mitigate uh, any impact on local residents. And I think that we need to do that as well. So I think we should support our local residents in North Adelaide who are going to face the brunt of this new development across uh, straight in front of them. But I also think we should be making those submissions to the state government now and start that process now to uh, mitigate noise and impacts. Uh, look, Lord Mayor, I, I would like to speak to it, not least because it concerns uh, residents who I represent. It is confusing. It does imply, in my view, with the addition of the second part, that the Brownfield site is ruled out because clearly we would have no interest in traffic loss of amenity and other matters, as I suggested. Uh, however, I certainly uh, disagree with the notion that the site should remain as is proposed by the state government uh, on uh, the site of uh, Barton Terrace West and Jeffcott Street near the intersection there. Um, I think elected members need to understand that there's a great deal of concern uh, among residents at the moment, not least because what they're being asked to comment on is a 72-page code amendment proposal. Um, which is not a development proposal. There's been no development plan released by the state government. And so there is no form, as we understand form, to the $82.4 million <coughs> complex that uh, the government is seeking comment on. In fact, it's merely seeking in principle support for that development without providing any detail, and that is what they're terribly concerned about. Um, and further, there is within the documentation 
associated with the invitation for comments on the uh, uh, code amendment, a worrying description of that site and what it will do. And I quote, it will host a range of passive and active recreational activities with a high level of amenity, including a safe and connected walking and cycling network, natural areas, sporting fields, club facilities, formal cultural gardens, public artwork, passive recreation areas, as well as opportunities to support a variety of temporary events, such as festivals, concerts and sporting events. No mention of water recreation, and that is a matter of some concern to residents. So, Lord Mayor, I do speak in support of this, but I am troubled that we are, to all intents and purposes, sending a signal that a brownfield site is off the table. But I do ask the administration particularly to understand that that site, as it is proposed by the state government, is not acceptable to the ratepayers of North Adelaide. Lord Mayor, if I can just get some clarity around uh, the consultation, purely because I've clicked on the link that um, uh, administration have provided in their commentary um, uh, and just some of the debate that's happened here in the chamber. So could I just get some clarification on the consultation that has taken place? Thank you. Uh, thank you. Through the presiding member, uh, to uh, clarify an earlier discussion point, this is um, consultation that all people can participate in. Um, so just to clarify that, um, the Deputy Lord Mayor is correct. There's a range of documents associated uh, with this consultation. Um, and there is an offer there um, to meet with relevant uh, department staff if people wish to um, in relation to um, more detailed um, elements that the Deputy Lord Mayor spoke to, such as entertainment, perhaps, if you could just clarify the scope of the um, amendment that's been consulted on, please, Ilya. Uh, thank you, and through the Chair, um, uh, to, uh, also to be very clear, the, the consultation documentation is regarding the code amendment, so this is not a a presupposition of any development approval. Um, this is purely about setting the, the zone conditions for the envisaged type of development proposed by DIT at, at this site. Um, to, to unpack to some degree what um, DIT we understand are looking to engage the public on with regard to the changes they're seeking in this code amendment is to clarify current envisaged uses, and I'm not looking to unpack in great detail, there's further work we can do there, um, and, or, nor to speak for the department, but it's to make clearer within the code amendment through their view, the types of activities that already in, uh, occur at the existing venue and make it clear in the proposed site that DIT have put forward um, for the development of the new aquatic centre. So hence references to entertainment, not inconsistent with the parties and events that would be held in the current location. They're looking to increase specificity within the definition of what's allowed within the overlay that would be in the code amendment should that proceed through this consultation process. So, um, is, does that answer your question? So, um, members, I think that we've accepted this as a variation with the agreement of Councillor Giles. I will now put it, if you're happy, um, to the vote as in two parts so that people can choose to vote for whichever part they agree with. Um, part one, all those in favour? Those against, that's carried. And a division has been called. Could all members in favour of part one of the motion please rise and stay standing until your name has been called? Councillor Elliott, Councillor Noon, Councillor Kouros, Councillor Davis, Councillor Lee, Councillor Seventer, Councillor Snape, Councillor Martin and Councillor Giles. Thank you members and part two, as varied. All those in favour? That's carried, thank you. A division has been called. Could all members in favour of part two of the motion please rise and stay standing until your name has been called? 
Councillor Ho, Councillor Elliott, Councillor Noon, Councillor Kuros, Councillor Davis, Councillor Lee, Councillor Siebentritt, Councillor Snape, Deputy Lord Mayor and Councillor Giles. Thank you. That's carried. Um, we will now move on to motions without notice. If there are none, I'll move to exclude the public for a confidential debate. Um, I should explain to the members of the public who've been sitting here patiently for so long that we have a couple of contracts to deal with. They're just processes that uh, will be the last item on our agenda, so there's perhaps no reason to hang around after this. Thank you. Sorry, Lord Mayor, your microphone. Thank you. We're required to exclude the public. Uh, of the two items, we will move each um, confidentiality I, um, element separately. Um, so I seek as item now, um, which is the exclusion for um, the first item, which is 18.1. Um, and the reason for exclusive, to exclude the public is that there is confidential material to be discussed. So could I ask, moved by Councillor Kouros, seconded by Councillor Ho. All those in favour? That's carried. Thank you unanimously. And the second exclusion is for 18.2. Moved by Councillor Kouros, seconded by Councillor Ho. All those in favour? That's carried again. Thank you. finishing and closing the meeting. So can I thank you members and uh, I shall see you next time. <laughs>